the two of them in particular, they just got me enthusiastic about science. They were so excited themselves. And they really tried to teach you, not to tell you, memorize this and memorize that. They made you understand things and got you involved in the experiments. And my fear is that has changed these days. Everybody's so worried about safety and I don't think the teachers are so excited. But we had a lot of teachers clearly in that time who were ex-World War II. They'd been in the military one way or the other and they, you know, this was now their lifetime you know, thing they wanted to do to make the world better, I guess. He was my chemistry teacher and he just got you excited now. He just didn't recitate it to you. He got you involved and he was excited, so he got you excited. I wouldn't say he got all the class excited because he really wanted you to work and do things. And the more you did things, the more excited you got. I like teaching the first year students because they're still excited. They've come out of high school. They, no, they're not. After the second or third year in college, a lot of students are kind of blasé. No, this is we're just going to get our degree. The first year students are still super excited. And I try to get them involved to learn how to learn. I don't want them just reciting stuff back to me. So I think I'm very different to most teachers because I spent 15 years in the industry. So the first class I tell them, I, I will tell you what you need to know and I'll tell you specifically what you don't need to know and I'll tell you which chapters in the book you can completely forget. So I try to get them real life examples of chemistry and physics, not just what the book teaches them. So an example, I'll tell them you've got an airbag in your car. How much chemicals you have to put in that airbag to make it expand, not just do a theoretical calculation. And you know, we made them make the superconductor, the one, two, three superconductor, skip the first 150 pages in the textbook. It says, you will learn how to balance equations because if you don't balance it right, your superconductor will not levitate. So a lot of peer pressure then. And they want to make sure theirs levitates and doesn't, doesn't go boomf. Use your imagination. Don't just go by the book and don't believe what you read in the literature. You know, really imagine the future, come up with new ideas and pursue those and don't let people put those ideas down. Very much believe in yourself and discuss your ideas with others. No. But don't, don't follow what your boss tells you to do necessarily. <laughs> so at Oxford, my advisor went on sabbatical after I think my first six months a year. That's, so I was on my own really for a year and did my own thing. And when I went to Stanford as a postdoc, after two months, my advisor went to Washington DC for two years. So he told me, you're running the group for the two years now. So really I had the freedom to do, I won't say almost anything, but most things. And I think that's very important. I, for my own students, I don't say, this is what you should be doing this week, next week and so on. But just tell me in advance what you're going to be doing and maybe I'll comment on it. It's still focused research. We, we get money to do certain things, but it's not specific things. So we have to come up with better batteries or better ways of making things. And their job is to do that. But we don't say you have to do A, B, C. Use your imagination to do the best thing you can do. It, it would be very difficult. When I start off, I had the choice of university or industry. I chose industry because industry had large corporate labs where you could do very, very good basic research. I would say much better than you can do, could do in university because they had the money. Nowadays, that's totally changed. So there are, those corporate labs don't exist, I don't think, anywhere in the world anymore. So you have to go to universities, then you have to try to get tenure, you have all these challenges, which I didn't really have. I went from ministry to a tenured faculty position in university. So I th think things have changed, but you still got to do your own thing. You just, Swing with the punches, don't fight, don't fight them because it won't help you. It's more a free environment, no, don't put too much pressure on. No, particularly don't have exams all the time, which I fear is an American problem right now. Students study to exams and they don't really think about a problem, what's the best way of solving that problem and what's the real future. They're too much worried about the short term. 
and that's the same in business. Science is always competitive, but we, we compete, as it were, you know, maybe with a Chinese university or a German university or Swedish university, but I think on the campus you want to be collaborative because I weren't, you know, learnt in industry. That in a group you would have physicists, chemists, material science, all in the same group. So I want my students to understand that you can't do everything just as a chemist. You have to work with a physicist, a geologist, and you learn their speech, as it were. No, the same thing may have a different name in chemistry than it does in physics and it does in geology. And they have to be able to understand that and really understand the culture of the different disciplines. So in Exxon now, as a manager, both in science and engineering, the scientists would roll in maybe about nine o'clock. They might still be there early evening. The engineers would all be there at 7 or 7.30 in the morning. They'd all leave by about 3.30 in the afternoon. So very, very different approach to work. Oh, it's absolutely essential. I run an energy centre. We have 10, 10 different um, universities, national labs in it. They spread from San Diego in the west to University of Cambridge in England in the east. So each one of us has our own skill. No, Cambridge is much better at one thing than I am. And the San Diego folks are better at, say, theory than I could. So we all work together. The students work together. They have um, weekly video calls where they talk to each other without any faculty there. So they can discuss things without fear of, no, we're going to say, hey, that's stupid or something. No, they can do their own thing. Well, you've got to remember, I was in Germany at the big battery meeting. And uh, I think they called me, what, was 11.15 in the morning. Then it became public at 11.45. And the last speaker of the morning session was giving his talk. And then they said, no, no questions. We've got a big announcement to make. Then basically all hell broke loose in the, in the meeting. And then all the press, by that time, they were all outside ready. And this was in um, Ulm, Germany. And then I had a very good experience coming back in Lufthansa. And, uh, the gauge agent said, oh, you just got the prize, didn't you? <laughs> Do you want a seat up front in the plane? It was very nice when I got on the plane said, there's empty seats. This is a seat you're going to sit in, and this is a seat we're going to make up for your bed. Well, I got involved in what we call solid-state ionics, how ions move fast. And I worked on a compound called beta alumina, and that was about 1970. At the same time, John Goodenough was trying to make a, a new material like that, based on um, the same ideas that had come out of literature. So he and I knew each other. I think it was about, I was just looking at about 1977, we organized a big energy symposium in New York City. And we jointly published a book on that. So I've known him since then. Today, we both participate in the Battery 500 Consortium. So we still do research together, even today. Um, Dr. Yoshino, I think I've met maybe two times in Japan. He doesn't go on, how can I put it? on the international um, meeting circuit, like John and I and others do. Well, let's start. when I went to Exxon, we were actually working on superconductors. So we were working on superconductors, and I was synthesizing some of them, and so a lot of energy was evolved. So I said, we can store energy in this. So we started uh, on these, what we call layered sulfide structures. Um, we found out they would, um, store energy. Within a few weeks, we got Exxon to buy us the equipment so we could do it in a real environment. I was then sent off to New York City to meet with a committee of the Exxon Board of Directors to explain to them what we we're doing. I had about five, ten minutes is my recollection. And within a week, they said, yes, let's do this. Because Exxon those days treated research like drilling oil wells. Maybe 10% would be successful. So maybe 10% of the research ideas would be successful. So we started building batteries. We had a development team. They had a manufacturing t team, built a manufacturing facility. Um, so that went very well. But about 10 years later, you know, Exxon Management looked at this, that, no, they're a huge oil company. And they said, what's the market? And the, they said the market wasn't $100 million a year, and that was back about 1980, so it's probably a billion dollars now. 
So they asked themselves, why are we in these markets? And the other big thing that had changed, oil prices had gone up about 1973, 74, then they had dropped dramatically. So there was less interest in fuel cells, batteries, solar cells. So they decided to get out of those markets. But their original goal was to build electric vehicles. So they'd bought an electric motor company to make the motors, and they were gung-ho to make it work. They were really too early. The timing was just not right. And had it been 15, 20 years later, it would have worked probably much better. That's life, isn't it? <laughs> now, if we don't have a sustainable environment, what do we leave for our children and grandchildren? So we have to know, make things better, not create CO2, and then recycle everything. We can't just you know, toss things aside. I think Sweden's probably much better at that than the US, where we just toss things on the side. But we have to have a sustainable environment. We have to do something about global warming, which I tend to call global messing up, because we've seen to have more extremes of both heat and cold, and certainly more big storms. So I think the big issue in a place like New York City is how do we make it um, safer so if we have the, when the next storm comes in, we'll still have electricity for the hospitals, electricity to pump gas in the gas stations, because when they had the big storm came through, they had plenty of gasoline, but no electricity to pump it. So I think, no, those things we have to do, we have to be more responsible about it. Well, the first thing is not use so much energy. If you look at the energy consumption in the U.S. per capita compared with Europe, it's more than twice as much. So the easiest way of to be more sustainable is just use less energy. It's the simplest way, and it's where everybody can contribute. You have to ask my wife that. She says it's too competitive at tennis, <laughs> particularly when we play doubles. <laughs> um, science is competitive in a sense, but you really try and... You, you're competing against the unknown. And, but these days you're also competing against the thousands of others around the world working in your field. So you want to make sure you get something done that's good. And something where your students won't, they won't do the research and whoops, somebody's already published it. So I think it's getting more and more competitive in that sense. And, but that's why I said they've got to think about what they're doing, just don't go through the same path as everybody else. First, you had to do sports in England at that time. That wasn't an option. <laughs> uh, but it's teamwork. And in the end, science is teamwork. You can't do everything by yourself. So sports is the same thing. It's, it's all teamwork to make it successful. And in a sense, you have to get your mind off what you're doing at work some hours a day. So I played a lot of tennis when I was a scientist. And that just gets your mind off what you're doing it can refresh itself so when you go back the next day, you're ready to get back to it. I have a large yard that needs lots of work. I still grow, I grew cacti as a teenager, I still grow cacti. And if you look at my car, it's called My Cactus, because we bought it in Arizona. It was green at one stage. My latest one is now white. So I got a lot of teasing, you can't have a white cactus. And I said, yes, you can. And, there's a certain cactus called Cephalosirius senilis, and I tell them that means the grandfather cactus or the old man cactus, so it's very appropriate. And it's covered with white hairs, so it looks totally white. I don't know, I started in England when I was maybe 12, 13 years old and grew hundreds of them there. They're just different. My wife would maybe say it's a hobby, but I like seeing new environments. Um, the, Clearly, science is an international discipline, so you tend to travel. The better known you are, the more you travel. But our family normally meets every Christmas, New Year. So my wife and I escape from the New York winter. New York's beautiful in the summer, so we take our annual vacation in the winter. So we've been to the Maldives one year. We've been to Hawaii another year, Bangkok. Last year, uh, Malaysia. So we tend to go to warm places and the whole family all 10 of us go somewhere other and spend three or four weeks together. You've got to see the rest of the world. You can't just see your own backyard. It's seeing different cultures, meeting different people. What I don't like about traveling is all the plane stuff. And that was easy in the old days. It's not easy anymore. But you know, it's, 
seeing all the different things. So when I go to Sydney, I try to go to the Sydney Opera House one night. If you get tired of something, all you have to do is go to the ferry terminal, cost you maybe a dollar or something, you can get on the ferry and just go for a half hour ride over Sydney Harbour and come back and just thoroughly relaxing. And I'm excited and I think particularly excited because I understand um, they've just switched the batteries over from some old fashioned batteries to lithium ion batteries. I want to ask them how are these batteries are working out. Did it, was there any real issue? Jessica, Stan Whittingham here. I understand you've recently undertaken spacewalks to replace the old nickel-based batteries with the new lithium-ion batteries on the exterior of the st station. How do these batteries compare with those you've been used to in the past? <laughs> well, first of all, for all three of you, it is truly an honor to be speaking with you and these scientific greats like the three of you today. And Dr. Whittingham, we understand that as a founding father of rechargeable lithium-ion batteries, we have you to thank for our significant power upgrades here on the International Space Station. Oh, it's great, because I know they've been using lithium-ion batteries on the, the Mars and lunar rovers for some time now. So, but now, now they're on the space station itself, it's great. My scientific career got started because of the Russians. So there was a Sputnik era, so I was at Oxford, and it was the US Air Force that paid for my undergraduate research look how atoms reacted on nose cones of rockets. So they were very concerned about reactions there. They were also concerned the Russians were ahead of the Americans. So they pumped lots of money in, and that was really a big push in science there, and particularly when I went to Stanford. A lot of money to catch up on all that technology. My research gets funded by the US Department of Energy. Um, some of it's very fundamental not targeted to any particular you know, battery system, and the other part is very much focused on electric vehicles. How can we increase the energy density, the safety, reduce the cost of, of batteries? And that's all you know, driven to um, what we call the electrical century, off the coal and oil century. And I think particularly happens at New York State, of all the 50 states in the US has the largest legal target now for grid energy storage, which is like three gigawatt hours within the next five or six years. So they're pushing extremely hard to do that. Well, I think everybody today says they could find a cure for cancer of all sorts. That would be the biggest discovery. Well, we don't expect any quantum leaks in batteries, but what we're hoping for is, you know, they'll be safer. We'll cut the price in half and that in the end everybody will have, I won't say necessarily electric, fully electric car, but at least a partially electric car, and that in all major cities all the vehicles will be totally electric. <laughs>